All right. Um, just to uh, refresh your memory on where we uh, ended up last time, we were talking about um, these different trabeculae um, and the fact that um, what we're really looking at is, is stress and strain. Uh, and what the difference is, is that strain is a measure of deformation and stress is the amount of energy or force that's being applied at that particular location. Uh, so what these trabeculae are all about is resistance to strain. So they're designed to prevent deformation of the structure. And it's sort of nice because these right here are tolerating compression and these that are going in that way are tolerating tension when there's force being applied at one end. So there's the stress being applied right there. And then these things are resisting that. And then the resolution of those is that neutral layer. Um, that has sort of an interesting, um, just as an interesting side note, there, I worked on this paper a couple of years ago um, as an editor. This woman out of this German, out of the Max Planck Institute in Germany was working on European beavers. And beaver, as you know, have these gigantic incisors, and they're using those incisors to cut into wood, right? So they, they fell trees using, um, using their teeth, all right? So when they do that, they're applying an enormous amount of force, and most of that force is being applied by the lower incisors. So if you Think about how a beaver jaw is set up. The tooth is curved and goes into the, uh, into the alveolus. So if you think about it, most people when they think of that, they think that the tooth is tolerating shear forces. And they imagine that the tooth is going to be sheared off right at the base of the tooth where the tooth enters into the alveolus. But that turns out not to be the case. What's happening to the tooth is it's tolerating compression. So as it's fighting down, the tooth is being forced down like that and because the tooth curves and the alveolus is curves, it's sliding in like that. And what this woman did was she looked at the fine structure of the connection between the tooth and the cavity where the tooth goes. There are all these little crisscrossing microfibrils which are holding the tooth into place and they can shift a little bit. So what ends up happening is when the beaver bites down, the tooth is forced in there these little fibers tighten up and hold in place. They allow a little bit of movement, and the tooth remains rock solid. So it doesn't have to deal with shear. Every force that it contends with is compression, which is much easier. Nobody had ever figured that out before. It was, uh, it was pretty cool. So now we've talked already a little bit about the femur, and uh, in particular the neck of the femur. Uh, and we noted that in humans, all the weight is being applied right here on this end of it. And here, if we look at those trabeculae, we see the same sort of pattern, this crisscrossing pattern, right? And you can look at this neutral layer that goes right up, you know, follows those things. All this stuff down here is hollow, right? That's where blood is going to be formed. That's where the bone is very dense and thick. That's all hollow. And there you have these trabeculae, and they're designed, just like on that beam, to tolerate compression and to tolerate tension. So here, you have this nice system set up where you can just map out exactly where that primary force is going to be applied to this bone. It's an ideal setup. Up until a certain size, right? And that's what we talked about last time. When you look at an elephant, the whole business of the elephant is dramatically different, right? The hips are not set up like your hips. There's the acetabulum. The acetabulum is actually rotated like that and sits right on top of the head of the femur so that all of the forces that this femur has to tolerate are going to be compressive forces, not shear forces, right? 
and we talked last time about dinosaurs and what limits the, total, the maximum size of a dinosaur or any terrestrial vertebrate. And that's simply the fact that the columns, which form up the leg, the strength of those columns increases as the square, right? The strength of the bone is a function of the cross-sectional cross area of the bone. And the area is going to be pi r squared. So as the animal gets bigger, right, the strength of the bone increases as the square of the radius. The mass, on the other hand, increases as the cube of the length. So the cube of something is going to increase much more rapidly than the square. So the body mass is increasing faster than the ability of the column to support it. And that is what places the upper limit on how big these animals can be. Notice what else is happening in the leg of this elephant. So it's a columnar limb, and they are ungulates, which means that they are digitigrade. Okay? For the most part, ungulates are digitigrade. That is, they're standing on their tippy toes. Your cat, if you have a pet cat, is digitigrade. Your dog is digitigrade. They're standing on their tippy toes. You are plantigrade. You're standing on the heel of your foot, and then the rest of your foot sticks out into the front. You can make your leg longer by standing on your tippy toes, right? So digitigrade works better if, if you want to run fast, OK? So here's this incredibly heavy animal, and it's digitigrade. And yet what the animal is doing those toes are stretched out like a tripod, and then right behind it is the gigantic cartilaginous fatty kind of a cushion which supports the bottom part of the foot. So it is designed to tolerate compressive forces, and it has a little extra stability because there's a tripod down at the end. So one other thing, just thinking about elephants and I mean they are they are they're awesome animals they're unique right and just the sheer mass of these guys it, it, you have to think about all sorts of things think about what's going on here with the head that head is enormously heavy okay and you think that the fact oh elephants are so smart they never forget all that kind of stuff stuff it's nonsense the brain is relatively small. Most of that skull are these sinuses, so these big cavities that are up there, okay, filled with air, basically. Well, what, why would they do that? Why not just fill it up with brain? Well, air turns out to be lighter than brain matter. Air is lighter than bone. So they're trying to minimize the mass of the head. Why would they want to do that? Because if you have that big, heavy head, you've got to be able to hold it up. The muscles that are going to be used to hold that head up have to go from here all the way back to the neural spines on the vertebral column. So the bigger and heavier that head is, the more muscle mass you're going to need in order to pull it up. And you can see that when you look at the bison skeleton, if you've looked at the neural spines on the back of, on the, on the thoracic vertebrae, you see that it's just enormous. They're really long, and that's because they are providing leverage for the muscles that are holding up the head. And of course, for the elephant, it's compounded by the fact that they have these huge tusks, right, which weigh an awful lot. There's another animal that has lots of air sinuses on its skull. Anybody know what it is? It's a pest species here in Missouri. Deer? No. Oh, deer don't have very many sinuses. Pigs. Feral hogs. Okay. The reason for their sinuses, their sinuses, you know, are involved in combat. So when these guys are banging their heads together when they're fighting, they're using those sinuses to cushion the brain. All right, so back to stress and strain. 
Note that those trabeculae are crossing each other at these 90 degree angles. Okay? So what you've set up in the long bones at any rate is a structure that's ideally suited to tolerate, um, to tolerate strain, right? And at the same time has a lot of open area where you can produce blood. If you look at the, at the histology of dinosaur bone, you realize that the bone is set up fundamentally differently. You don't have the kind of trabeculae in reptilian bone, especially not in dinosaur bone, that you have in mammal bone or in bird bone. I wonder why that is. Why is it that mammals can have such an elaborate, sort of interesting, highly derived structure on the inside of their bones, and reptiles don't? Birds do it, mammals do it, reptiles, dinosaurs don't. What's the difference? What's different about being a reptile versus being a mammal or a bird? Thermoregulation. Pardon? Thermoregulation. Thermoregulation, right? So mammals and birds have high body temperatures. Well, so do reptiles. So do dinosaurs. The biggest problem that the dinosaurs had was staying cool, not getting warm. So it's not just having a high body temperature, it's the fact that how they're generating that heat. Mammals and birds are endothermic. Reptiles are ectothermic, with some endothermic. Okay? There are some endothermic reptiles. But the difference is that the mammal has to maintain its body temperature at a high level, so it's metabolically expensive. What that means is that both the mammal and the bird are living sort of on the knife's edge of existence. They have to be able to maintain that high metabolic rate, which means if they want to have any energy left over for reproduction, they have to be pretty darn efficient at it. How do you get that kind of efficiency? One way you do it is by being efficient in the way you move. What's going to determine how efficient you can walk? Has anybody ever seen a dwarf or a midget? How do they walk? How does a midget walk? Do they walk like you? No. Why not? They've got legs, hips, and everything just like you. They're just short. Why are they walking differently? I mean, you can, they're doing one of these things, right? There's this guy, um, Carl Koopmans, the absolute scariest guy on the planet. Um, at scientific meetings, at mammal meetings, he'd sit in the front row center, and everybody that would give a paper, and he showed up for every darn paper. People had go, students would go in there, and they'd see Carl Koopman sitting in the front row, and they were just free. He was, the, he, was, he was so smart, he knew something about everything. And he'd always have a question at the end of a presentation. And he would always say, well, it seems to me, and then he would lay into some criticism of what this person had done. He was, the, uh, he was a specialist on bats at the American Museum of Natural History in, um, in New York City. He was an amazing guy. He was a dwarf, little tiny guy about that big. Okay. And he would walk like that. He had this really funny kind of a gait. Amazing, amazing guy. He was just brilliant. Anyway, why did he walk like that? He was the dwarf. So bigger than a midget, but he was little. All right. How does an eight foot tall human being walk? Do they walk like you? No, they don't. They walk differently. Why is that? Is At the Cape Girardeau Public Library, they used to have a handprint of Michael Jordan. You guys don't even know who Michael Jordan was. Okay. 
So the kids could put their hands inside the print made by Michael Jordan and see how big their hands were compared to Michael Jordan's. So how tall was Michael Jordan? Probably pretty close to seven feet, maybe not quite there. But his hand, I put my hand in there, his hands were twice the size of mine. I'm six feet tall. His hands were twice that big. And he's only about a foot taller than me. You're going, what the hell? That's why those guys can palm a basketball. I can't palm a basketball. But those guys can palm it, right? It's like holding a grapefruit or something compared to us. So we have these little tiny hands, those basketball players. Why do they have those giant hands? And look at their effing feet. Their feet are effing huge. What's up with that? I would love to see one of those guys shake Donald Trump's hands. You know, his little tiny hand. Could be that great big hand. Be fun. Okay. Why do they have such big hands and feet? It's because of allometry. Think about it. When you're when, if you have a brother or a sister or a family member that has a newborn baby, you get to see the newborn baby, what do you notice about the baby? It's fat. It's fat? Only temporarily. They lose all that weight pretty quickly. Big head. Big head. Their heads are giant. Their head makes up a fourth to a third of the body. Okay. And then something happens. They grow into, an, into adults and they get these little tiny pinheads. Okay? They get these little tiny heads. The rest of the body kept growing. The head stopped growing. Your head stops growing relatively early in life. The body keeps going. Okay? The head has negative allometry. The body has positive allometry. Your hands and your feet have positive allometry. Okay? We stop growing at a certain height, six feet, five feet, somewhere in there, we stop growing. And it turns out that at that height, all of our body proportions are ideally suited to the kind of locomotion we use. All right? In a reptile, a reptile grows isometrically, not allometrically. So it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It never reaches that optimum shape, that op those optimum, optimum proportions for ideal locomotion. The bigger it gets, man, the worse it gets at locomotion. Okay? That's why the dwarf is going through this allometric sort of pattern, this allometric trajectory, and gets stuck at a weird place and it doesn't work very well, but that's what they're stuck with. You, a normal-sized mammal, right, have this ideal set of proportions which enables you to work just fine. Okay? So, what piles? Because they can't optimize those proportions, right? They are unable to optimize all of those components inside the bone, right, that we exploit as high-cost mammals. All right, so now let's think just a little bit about the appendicular skeleton. So we're using that appendicular skeleton primarily for propulsion. Well, in fishes, fishes move by lateral undulation. Although there are some fishes that are using their appendages for locomotion as well. And I'm thinking of things like the crossoptorygians or lung fishes or things of that sort. Okay? So our limbs consist of a proximal element and a distal set of elements. All terrestrial vertebrates have one, and fish, have one proximal element, and then the lobe fin fishes have two distal elements. So you have one bone up here and two right here. You have one bone up here and two down here. Okay? That's the standard setup. And then those bones are anchored to the vertebral column using a girdle. And the girdle for your hips is attached solidly to the vertebral column. So you have three bones in your hips, 
ischium, ilium, and pubis. And then you have, well, you as a mammal have basically just one bone, two bones up here, namely the scapula and the clavicle. Okay? But this joint up here is a little bit different than the one down here. And I'm going to talk about that in just a few moments. Okay? So that limb design is consistent. Okay? And I'm going to skip all of that stuff with fishes, except to point out something about what a fish is doing as it's moving through the water. The problems that the fish has to solve are basically the same problems that a bird solves when it's moving through the air. Fishes and birds are moving through a fluid. You move through a fluid as well. When the fish moves through a fluid, the fluid right, is pretty viscous. It's water. When a bird moves through a fluid, it's not viscous. It's moving through air. Okay? But all the things that the fish has to do are the same things the bird has to do. It has to control roll, pitch, and yaw, just like an airplane. So roll, you know what roll is, pitch, and then yaw, whether you're going straight ahead or whether you're flying sideways. And if you look at all of the appendages on the fish, they're designed to enable this animal to control roll, pitch, and yaw. It's interesting, if you look at sharks, how do the tails of sharks differ from the tails in tuna? What's different? Well, what, first of all, what's weird about sharks? American cartilage. Pardon? Cartilage. Cartilage instead of bone. That's one thing. What else? Anybody ever eaten shark? No. Maybe gone fishing out on the beach, caught a bunch of sharks and barbecued them up? If, if, they're, if paired properly, they're just fine. Okay? The thing about sharks is they are osmoconformers. And the way they regulate osmotic concentration is they store urea in their muscle tissue. Which means if you just catch a shark and throw it on the barbecue pit and, you know, barbecue it up, put some sauce on it, and then take one bite into it, basically what it tastes like is one of those cakes they put in the bottom of a men's urinal in a restaurant, public restroom. That's what it tastes like. Okay? Not that I've ever tasted one, but I can imagine, okay? Because the muscle tissue is filled with urea. So here's this rather dense fish. And what they do is this top part of the tail is much longer than the bottom part of the tail. It's called a heterocircle tail. And what that means is when they're undulating side to side, because this thing is longer, it's driving the back part of the fish down and the front part of the fish up. So that's how it's maintaining its position in the water column. If it stops swimming, it'll begin to sink. Okay? All right. So let's look at the, the ways in which these appendages articulate with the rest of the body, okay? Let's look at a couple of examples. Let's look at the way the hip articulates, and then let's look at the way the shoulder articulates. If you've ever gone to the rec center, and I know, and I know I'm not recommending that you go now during this pandemic and all of that. Once the pandemic is over, we can go back to the gym and all that kind of stuff. Go into the rec center and watch the gimps when they go in for their workout. So go early in the morning, you know, and all the gimpy old geezers and are walking around the track with their little walkers and canes and stuff. And, and then go in and watch them lift weights. And you'll see them in front of the mirrors, you know, doing with their little, you know, two and a half pound weights or something, trying to do these arm things. What do you notice about them? First thing you notice is they can't get their arms very high. Most of them can go up like this, you know, with really light weights. Few of them can get their arms all the way up like that. 
Why is that? Is it lack of fluid in their joints? But something is going on. So that's what the shoulder looks like. So you have the glenoid fossa on the scapula, which is open like that. And now you have the head of the femur, which is sticking in there like that. And now you have all of these different, um, all, of this, all of this cartilaginous material right there, all of that connective tissue, which is holding it into place. Okay? So you have these tendons and ligaments which are holding it into place. And the, the nice thing about that is you get this nice range of motion. You can move your arm through an amazing range of motion. Okay? Except as you get older, that connective tissue, those ligaments and tendons, they lose their elasticity. And as they become less elastic, I mean, they're becoming stiff. And suddenly, as they become stiff, you can't move them as much, and the range of motion in that appendage becomes less and less and less. You guys know who Bob Dole was? The senator from Kansas, who years ago ran for president until he fell off the stage and everybody decided he was too gimpy, and that was it. He never made it any farther than that. Back in the days when we still gave a shit about who our president was. Okay. <laughs> that sort of thing. But the fun thing about Dole is he couldn't raise his hands at all. He could hardly get them even up like that. And the reason for that was is because in the Second World War he got shot down and had these insane injuries and whatnot. I mean, it was, he was like that from the time he was in his 20s up through the rest of his life. He hardly had use of his arms at all, okay? And the same was true with John McCain, you know, who got shot down over Vietnam and was in a POW camp for five years, right? He could hardly move, I think one arm in particular, he could hardly move it at all, okay? But what happens is all of that connective tissue gets very, very stiff, and you lose that range of motion. This joint right here in your, in your girdle here is fundamentally different. It's a ball and it's this nice encapsulating socket. It's locked into place, okay? The result is it's a nice, it's a nice sort of a joint, but you don't get anywhere near the range of motion that you otherwise would. Why is it that women gymnasts are so good at doing the splits and males not. Is it the angle? Yeah, it's all about the angle on the neck of the femur. Okay? When you, if you've ever tried to work on splits and getting your legs as far apart as you possibly can, there, there are three muscles in there, right, which go from the top of the femur right up to the pubis, and those muscles are dense and tight. And those are the muscles you're working on when you're trying to do those splits. They're there to keep everything in nice and tight so that you can move in an efficient way. Why is it that this joint is so encapsulating and is such a nice, solid kind of a joint, and this one up here is free and open? What's the fundamental difference between back legs and front legs? And that's open not just for us, it's open for your dog and your cat and your pet monkey and your bird and everybody else. Why is it? So, just in case it's dislocated? Uh, it's hard to dislocate. I mean, unless you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, it's hard to dislocate. I mean, you're not going to dislocate your hip. You can dislocate your shoulder, but not your hip. But I don't think natural selection is working very strongly against preventing dislocation amongst primates. What's different? What, how do you use your arms and legs? How does your dog use front legs and back legs differently? The back legs are generally used to 
propel them forward. Back legs are all about propulsion. Okay? That's where the energy, the force comes to move you forwards. When a cheetah runs, or a horse runs, or a pronghorn antelope runs, what are the front legs doing? Keeping the chest off the ground. Steering. That's it. Okay? The back legs is where all the force is being generated. The back legs is where the, all the energy is transmitted from the legs to the vertebral column. Not the front legs. These just keep your chest off the ground and steer. That's it. Okay? So because of that, this connection, because that's the one that's tolerating all these forces, that connection has to be nice and robust. And it is. All right, so when we talk about locomotion, right, um, and we think about the transition that animals have made from an aquatic lifestyle to a terrestrial one, okay, what's happening? In a fish, the entire body is supported by water. In a terrestrial animal, like a horse or you, the body is supported at only a couple of points. In a horse, the body is supported at the hips and at the shoulders. In a whale, the body is supported everywhere. What happens when a whale gets washed up on a beach? It's still alive. You're asking yourself, what's the problem, man? Let him catch some rays on the beach, you know? They breathe there, shouldn't be a problem. Or we'll throw some water on him to keep him cool, and he still dies. Why does he die? When that whale is washed up on shore, he's crushed by his own body weight. Okay? When he's in the water, the water is supporting him on all sides. As soon as he's on land, he's crushed by his own body weight. Okay? The next thing is stability. The whale or the fish is supported on all sides by water. It's easy to be stable. Suddenly, when you're terrestrial, stability is an issue. Okay? You have to be able to move. Fishes move, if you're a, a fish, you move by lateral undulation. How do whales move? Do whales move by lateral undulation? No, they move by dorsoventral undulation. Why is that? That's because... If you look at the vertebrae, the vertebrae on a fish are just these little cylinders. You can easily move left to right, left to right. But as we've become terrestrialized, suddenly the forces that were designed to tolerate have changed. Our, ver our vertebral column has changed. Our joints have changed. And now we can no longer do that twisting sort of locomotion or that side to side locomotion. Salamanders and snakes still use lateral undulation, but by the time you get to birds and mammals, all that lateral undulation is gone. In mammals, we still have dorsal ventral undulation. Birds don't even have that. So birds have no movement in the chest or in the lower back at all. Somehow you still have to be able to breathe. That means you have to be able to ventilate the lungs. What the hell? Well, of course, right? But wait, how does a lizard ventilate its lungs? What problem does the lizard face? How do you ventilate your lungs? What do you use to ventilate your lungs? The diaphragm. The diaphragm. So you have a sheet of muscle which is going across the bottom of your rib cage, okay? And that sheet of muscle, when all your viscera down below it, right, pull down, you're drawing air into your lungs. When you exhale, you're tightening up that diaphragm and forcing all the air out of your lungs. So you can ventilate your lungs using the diaphragm. Reptiles don't have a diaphragm. Their ribs go all the way down. They don't have a diaphragm. So how do they ventilate the lungs? Yeah, so what the guy does, the lizard moves this arm forward like that, that pulls these ribs out a little bit, which puts negative pressure on this lung, so this lung fills with air. This one comes back, 
pushes these ribs down, forces air out of this side. So when the lizard is doing this, he's ventilating the lungs. And he can only do it at a certain rate, and that is called carrier's constraint. Okay. So do they breathe out of like one lung each time they move or what? No, so first thing, the amount of air that they need is a fraction of the amount of air that you need. So they, they can, my roommate when I was in New Mexico was working on um, aquatic turtles. And we had one turtle in the lab that went nine hours between breaths. Okay? They only need 5% as much oxygen as you need because their metabolic rates are only 5% as high as yours. So they're sitting there, they're not using anywhere close to the amount of oxygen that you are. So no, they, they just have the one trachea, right, and they cannot get the air, but this one comes down, that one evacuates, that leg comes forward, this one fills, okay? And of course, the other thing that you have to worry about is desiccation, right? You're drying out. Well, reptiles have solved that problem, right? Because they have these scales which are impermeable to, to movement of water. Mammals, not so much. We lose an awful lot of water across our skin and across the surface of our lungs. Reptiles lose water across the surface of their lungs, but not across their skin. How about your dog? Tongue and the pads of their feet. Tongue and the pads of their feet. They do not have sweat glands across the skin. Okay. All right. So what ends up happening in the evolution of vertebrates is this transition from axial locomotion to appendicular locomotion. Okay. And when you look at appendicular or axial locomotion in fishes. Let's look at a variety of different myomeres in fishes. So we're going from fishes, things like a little amphioxus kind of a fish, to a hagfish, to something like a tuna or something like that. Okay? What's it? Do you guys know what the myomeres are? Every rib. So here's a vertebrae, like that. Here's the next vertebrae, like that. These myomeres go from one to the next, like that. Okay? If you've ever gone to Red Lobster and ordered their pre-digested fish, which is every fish they sell, okay, and you take your little fork and you can just tease apart each individual myomere. The only reason for going to Red Lobster is so that you can do your little comparative anatomy experiment, right? Teach the part of the myomeres. If you do that, here's a myomere. Look at this hagfish. It goes from one segment to the next. This one is going across multiple segments. Why is that? So in the slow-moving fish, those muscles are going from one vertebrae to the next, from one segment to the next. And these guys, it's going across multiple segments. Why is that? What's being achieved? Well, what's the difference between how a hagfish swims and how a tuna or barracuda swims? How fast are tuna? Very fast. Very fast. Okay. How fish are? How fast are hagfish? Not at all. How does bridging across those things help you swim faster? More muscle content. It's, it's additive across segments. When you were a kid, maybe if maybe they don't let you play that anymore. But when I was a kid, we would play this game called Snap the Whip. Okay? We're all the kids. You, you, you do it on the first day of class when a lot of the kids are clueless and don't know what's going on. Okay? So everybody holds hands. You follow the leader, and the kid in the front just starts running a little bit, and everybody's holding hands. And then the kid in the front will do that and pulls the kid that he's hanging on to, and that kid gets pulled, and he does the same thing. And every kid does the same thing, 
and then the kid on the very end, it's the summation of all those forces. Get, they all get added up, and the kid on the very end gets launched like a rocket all the way across the parking lot and into school buses or something. It's hilarious. They bring the ambulance, they take him to the hospital, put him in a body cast or something, he'll be fine. Okay? But it's that summation of forces, and that's what's happening here. And that's why that tuna or that barracuda is able to swim so fast, because each of these monomers is summing across multiple segments. So with the same amount of contraction, you're getting a lot more movement, right? And the forces being generated are much higher. So look at something like a hagfish, Ampioxus, or a hagfish, or a perch. Notice what happens to those myomeres on the side of the body. Now compare that with what happens in salamanders or lizards, and what happens in mammals. Okay? All of those myomeres are being reorganized. Okay? It's no longer these nice, simple sorts of things that you see right here. Now we have these intercostal muscles and these internal and external obliques. All of those muscles have been reorganized. And a big part of that is because we're no longer using these muscles very much for locomotion. All of our locomotion now is taking place right here. It's not up here anymore. These muscles right here now are designed just to keep stuff in. Okay? Or to help us twist, or to help us bend or something. It's no longer the sort of locomotor activity that they were once involved in, except for whales. But whales use dorsal ventral undulation. So if you look at your back, you still have, running the length of your back, these sacrospinalis muscles that are going from your pelvic girdle all the way up your back. And you have these rectus abdominal muscles right here, which are enabling you to do that, right? That six pack that you have right there. What's a common problem that people have as they get a little bit older and as they start packing on the weight? What do they complain about? Their back hurts. Their back hurts. It's those sacrospinalis muscles, which are incredibly dense and tight. Okay? So it's a muscle, which is, it's a high density muscle, which doesn't stretch out very well, okay? And because of that, right, and it's, it's a postural muscle, you're using it all day long. Even if you're sitting, you're using that muscle to hold you up. It's a muscle which doesn't get a lot of stretching. It doesn't flex very much. So it's susceptible to injury. So if you want to prevent that, then you need to stretch that muscle out, yoga or whatever it happens to be that you want to do. But notice how the organization of those muscles has changed as we've changed the way we move. So by comparison, right, fish versus mammal, what do you notice about the vertebral column? Well, what you notice is that here the vertebrae are basically all the same from the front of the animal all the way to the back. Here the vertebral column is regionalized. You have cervical vertebrae. There are no cervical vertebrae here. How many cervical vertebrae do mammals have? Seven. How many does a giraffe have? Seven. A shrew? Seven. A bat? Seven. A horse? Seven. A mouse? Seven. A chipmunk? Seven. Mammals have seven. Reptiles? Five. Amphibians? One or two. Okay, fish? None. So we've increased head mobility. Frogs can't look over their shoulder. If they want to see what's behind them, they have to turn around. Okay? You can look over your shoulder. Next, we have this thoracic region. That's where we have our ribs. Reptiles and amphibians don't have that. Reptiles and amphibians from there to there is all the same. But they're not, they're ventilating their lungs differently. How's about the, the number of vertebrae that anchor to the to the vertebral between the girdle and the vertebral column? In you, how many, 
How many sacral vertebrae do you have? Minimum of three, all the way up to nine. Armadillos have nine. You have three or four. Okay? Why is that? How many does a frog have? One. A salamander? One. A reptile? Two. Fish? None. The more connections you have between that girdle and your vertebral column, the more force you can generate back there. Somehow you have to transmit that force from the ground to the vertebral column. If you're going to generate a lot of force, then you need a strong connection. If it's only a little bit of force, then it's going to be a weak connection. Okay. So mammals have regionalized the vertebral column. Mammals have cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and caudal. Reptiles have cervical, trunk, sacral, and caudal. Fish just have trunk. There is one cool guy, and I'll end with that. That's the vertebral column from a hero shrew. And you're looking at that, and you think about the structure of most vertebrae. You've seen the cat and the monkeys back there. You look at the structure of those vertebrae. There's a centrum, there's a neural arch, there are these these transverse processes and then pre and post psychopathies. And then you look at this one and you go, holy smokes. Because this thing has all these psychopathies that are like combs that go in together like that. One of the things that the vertebral column is designed to do is to resist torsion. And this guy is going to have zero torsion, but also it's set up like a truss system. And what hero shrews do, they're about that big. They go up under rocks, and they lift the rocks up with their backs, and they feed on the insects that are underneath the rocks. So they're using that thing right there to pry up the rocks so they can get under it to feed. And the way, the, the way that animal was discovered was by um, uh, the mammalogist over at Southwest Missouri State, Lynn Robbins, who was in Africa working on his PhD back in, the, back in the late 70s. And he was hanging out with some pygmies. And these pygmies had a marriage ceremony. And what they did is they went out and caught these little animals. And as part of the marriage ceremony, the groom would stand on one of these hero shrews and balance himself as the hero shrew was walking around. And he had to balance himself on top. And he goes, what the hell is that thing? And when they were done with the ceremony, he caught the little hero shrew, skinned it, stuffed it, cleaned it, and took it back to, them to, um, to Missouri State. That specimen then got written up at the Field Museum. Um, Bill Stanley at the Field Museum saw it and went apeshit. They wrote a paper that got published in Nature a couple of years ago, right before Bill Stanley's death describing the hero shrew. It's amazing, this cool damn thing. But it's this weird design, right, to tolerate all this pressure on the back. All right, enough of that stuff. I will see you guys on, all this stuff will be posted online in the next couple of days. I will see you on Thursday, and I will try and have a video up to help you with downloading MorphoJ, so look for that. Yes, excellent. If you have your stuff in the Bone Mechanics Lab, great. Otherwise, bring it on Thursday, OK? So print that out. Yes, please. I do, I do. Um, when, when are you going out?